Hello logistics professionals, nice to meet you. Welcome to our Tapju fix on the topic why small forwarders are better. Are they really? I'm happy to have some experts from medium-sized forwarders, smaller and medium-sized forwarders today in our discussion here on LinkedIn Live. And I would like to start this session with a quick introduction into the topic. First of all, um, we have um, th this topic um, came up um, as I had a discussion with a good friend of mine some months ago and he said, well, um, you know, the large forwarders are never as good as the smaller ones. They typically do not deliver the same kind of service and that's why he's happy to work for a smaller forwarder. I understood his, um, his argumentation and I said, okay, Let's have a discussion with, um, uh, with managers working for medium size and smaller forwarders. Let me quickly um, um, use this opportunity to uh, make a, an announcement on, um, uh, on our new logistics marketplace, the new digital logistics marketplace where uh, forwarders can pre-register as of tomorrow. So if you uh, go to our webpage, uh, logisticsmarketplace.com, Uh, you can uh, pre-register and learn more about the logistics marketplace. Let's talk about um, uh, the topic um, of today. So when, when we look at the market, um, we always hear um, uh, about the, the large players. Here you see um, some uh, statistics um, uh, about the ocean freight. And interestingly, when you look into different sources, you get different numbers. That's why um, maybe the ranking is not 100% accurate. Maybe you are missing uh, somebody here on the list. And of course, the list is extensive. But when you see uh, that 71% of the ocean freight market does not belong at least to the top five um, providers, you see that there is a high level of fragmentation. When we uh, go on the air freight, um, uh, sorry, it's a bit small, but you, you see the, uh, the usual suspects here on the list, the Kühne Nagels, the Schenkers, the DSVs, and so on. Um, and um, uh, especially in the air freight market, you also have a very large um, uh, number of smaller um, and smallest forwarders who are also trying to uh, get their piece from the cake. When we... Um, see the, um, uh, the market, we uh, hear a lot about uh, consolidation, we um, uh, see that um, companies are um, yeah, either disappearing from the market or um, um, yeah, they, they simply have been bought by one of uh, the larger companies. This consolidation trend is uh, ongoing since more than 30 years. This uh, trend is nothing new but um, uh, it will continue. But when we look at the, um, the overall market in Europe, you will also see a lot of different numbers um, uh, when you look into different sources. But we are talking here about a market with a size of $1.1 trillion, um, uh, which um, is uh, an unbelievably uh, high number, although we have to consider that there might be some double countings in the revenues because when a forwarder uses a carrier, um, both appear in the numbers and uh, yeah, you count them double. But that's the current situation. So our, um, our starting point for the discussion is what differentiates a smaller forwarder from a larger forwarder? Do they have a chance to compete in the market? And um, I'm really happy uh, that uh, I have uh, some, uh, some experts here from, uh, from medium-sized players, and I will introduce them to you one by one. So we start with uh, Daniel Cole, just a second. I will switch this off. Daniel Cole. Hi, Daniel. Daniel Hi. is uh, in the freight forwarding industry since more than 20 years. Um, he uh, worked for a lot of, um, not, not a lot, sorry, uh, for several uh, large forwarders, global forwarders. Uh, he's based in Luxembourg, uh, a tiny little 
uh, country. And uh, um, uh, interestingly, we have a second person also born in uh, Luxembourg here in the panel. Um, uh, now, um, uh, Daniel is working for Geist Cargo. You can see that uh, on his nice T-shirt. Geist Cargo um, is a large, medium-sized forwarder, close to, uh, to be a, a, a big uh, forwarder. Um, and uh, it's a company with German origin, but with also a strong presence in Luxembourg. So the next person here um, uh, in our panel today is Arne Rietz. Arne is since uh, more than uh, a decade uh, in, the, um, in, uh, in the road freight uh, environment. He worked for medium-sized and large forwarders with assets or without assets. Since four years, um, uh, Arne is self-employed. Uh, he's consultant for transport and logistics companies with a strong focus on digitalization. Uh, the next um, here is Christoph Scheiter. Hi, Hi Christoph. everybody. Uh, Christoph uh, has studied uh, logistics. He's sales and key account manager since more than 10 years in the industry. He's working for Egetrans, um, mm -hmm. a precise freight forwarder in the um, air, ocean, and road freight environment. And he also goes... Uh, <laughs> The, the very nice uh, logo of his company. Uh, happy to have you on board. Then we have as next Pedro Vicente. Pedro um, um, has a very um, interesting background. He used to work, uh, um, sorry, I have to go into my notes. Uh, he used to work for 20 years on the customer side. Um, that means uh, he uh, brings a different perspective also into this discussion. Um, you worked with a lot of um, large uh, 3PL companies, but uh, in the last four years of your shipper's career, you shifted more to the smaller uh, uh, freight forwarders. Since one and a half years, you are now working for Novatrans, um, a smaller freight forwarder based in Spain. And last but not least, we have... Chris, uh, Chris Goodman on board. Hello, Chris. Chris is uh, a real veteran in, uh, in the industry, since more than 40 years, uh, um, uh, having worked for uh, some of the largest freight forward in the world. But now uh, he runs his own company, Anglo Freight, in the UK, uh, based in Southampton, where you help uh, startup companies and uh, young companies to develop their international trade. Happy to have you on board. So, Thank you. Um, I, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I want to continue with the first question where I will ask um, our, uh, our uh, panelists here um, about um, an opening statement. Please name three reasons why customers should work with smaller forwarder, with a smaller forwarder instead of using one of the global giants. And we start um, with, um, with our dear friend, Daniel. Daniel, I would like to get your statement. Please name three reasons. So hi, everybody. So I would say small freight forwarders are local. So that's very important. They are close to you. They have a good extent of networks. That's the second one. And they have a specialized knowledge in areas of their own expertise, whether it's in procurement, customs brokering, or freight forwarding. So that's the third one. Okay. I would have much more, but... Yeah, uh, uh, so, <laughs> sorry, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of quick. I had to adjust a bit. Yeah, uh, but thank you for that. I will now uh, switch over to, uh, to Arne. Um, Arne. Uh, I would say you uh, often find that the smaller forward are higher engagement than uh, with the larger players. Uh, it's uh, quicker to escalate problems to the person that is uh, involved and that could solve a problem. And uh, as Daniel said, um, the local localism is uh, something that uh, is also in their favor. Okay, thank you, Arne. I will switch to... Um... Uh, Christoph, Christoph, just a second. So, what? So, I think I will just uh, take over from from here. Jörg. 
um, based upon your your questions. Uh, for me, the three key reasons. Um, number one, it's uh, time to responsiveness um, slash also the flexibility to react, which um, goes also into the same direction that Arne has uh, in terms of escalating problems, but also expediting or expediting certain requests and requirements. Um, my second point would be um, out-of-the-box solutions, which also uh, Daniel already alluded to with regards to niche programs. Um, and my third point is indeed the personal contact, because what I found is that with uh, larger companies, you oftentimes have just um, bulk or team email addresses, whereas in uh, smaller or mid-sized companies, you have your dedicated contact um, for all or for each different area that you'd be looking for in order to get some information, whether it's operations or sales or whatever, you always have a name, um, mostly also a picture and a direct line to, to talk to. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. Um, oh, yeah. And last but not least, no, no, sorry. No, we have Pedro uh, in between, yeah? Pedro, now just... Let me switch this off. So, what about you? <clears throat> I would say uh, that my uh, my colleagues already mentioned uh, quite a few good reasons, and I would uh, basically say the same. So, uh, smaller carriers are usually more flexible. The reason also that your organization is smaller allows you to be quicker. Um, everybody in the organization knows the customer. <clears throat> so, from the general manager to the, the shift worker in the warehouse, we're all familiar with the customer, with the customer requirements. Um, that means that we are more we are more flexible, better adaptability to the customer needs. Uh, no difficult constraints if we want to uh, connect with customers, interfaces, etc. And I like they also said so better expertise usually on the local market. Um, we have quite good networks. Usually, big carriers they work with their own network. The fact that smaller have to look for collaboration gives them quite some interesting opportunities, which allows us to do out-of-the-box thinking and finding the interesting niche solutions for the customers. Thanks a lot, uh, um, uh, Pedro. Just a second. So, and now we switch over to Chris Goodman. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Good, good. good. So, um, the first reason I would say is that a uh, smaller freight forwarding company uh, would be able to make the time to explain difficult issues relating to, you know, and provide guidance to people that are just starting. And uh, there's also flexibility from the smaller forwarder to be able to appoint agents around the world and third parties that we work with, whereas a larger forwarder uh, is quite often tied to their own offices. And if those overseas offices aren't providing uh, a, a, a good service, um, they, they don't have the freedom to move around and find um, find other options. But the biggest thing, and this is uh, probably the most controversial point, unless you're moving very large volumes of cargo and uh, your TU count isn't above something like 500 a year, the larger folders actually don't want your business. So I know that's controversial, and uh, but I can say that is... Uh, absolutely true having worked for some of the biggest forwarders in the world and then having worked here at anglo freight so if you have um, a smaller flow of cargo of maybe one or two containers a month something like that the big forwarders won't have time for it they you, you'll get lost in their system but for us the smaller freight forwarding company that's our bread and butter that is what we um, uh, make our make our living Chris, I think that was a very important uh, point that you've mentioned. So you say the large customers are for the large forwarders and the smaller customers are for the smaller forwarders, if I'm uh, understanding you cor correctly. This is absolutely correct. So unless you're a, like a Sainsbury's or B&Q or something like that, you really should be working uh, and looking at the um, your local smaller forwarder to handle your cargo for you. We'll provide you with the service, we'll take good care of you, we'll make sure that you avoid any expensive mistakes. Uh, the actual larger forwarder, because of the, the way they're structured, where you have one department taking care of the accounts, another department taking 
uh, care of the uh, bookings, another department taking care of the quotes, another department taking care of the customs clearance. There's no interconnection between them. And you try finding your way around that, uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, whereas a smaller folder, I can shut down to the end of the office and ask the person in accounts, is, is everything okay with that? And uh, yeah, we'll sort it out. Very good, very good. Let's put this up for discussion. I will now uh, drag all the colleagues in so we can have uh, a discussion all together. So um, quite impressive to have you all here on the screen. Um, I will um, now put um, the, the next question uh, here uh, on the screen. Um, when, when I talk to uh, larger companies, larger forwarders, they always claim that the economies of scale are the biggest advantage of the large forwarders. Better buying rates and carriers, uh, better buying rates and carriers and better productivity lead to better costs. Can smaller forwarders really compete? Yes, I know this is quite uh, a controversial question and provocative, but what's, what's your uh, idea about this? What's, who wants to start? Christoph, you are working for um, a medium-sized forwarder in Germany. Tell me. Correct. Yep. And uh, in fact, I would say uh, smaller and mid-sized companies can compete definitely, especially if we take a look uh, throughout the pandemic years. Um, it wasn't so much about the cost most of the time, but it, much, it was much rather about securing space in time um, and being able to offer concepts to get the cargo from A to B in time. Um, and what I've personally found throughout those years of the pandemic was the, that the flexibility uh, in order to provide solutions um, by a vast majority of clients actually was way higher valued than the potential savings of, I don't know, $100 or $200. You know, that's, that's my, my take on that. So, so you say um, the um, uh, the savings because of economies of scale and better buying rates, um, um, yeah, overestimated in comparison with the overall spend and the overall service quality. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, you get bottom line onto that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I would like to ask Pedro about that because uh, you were working on a on the customer side. And you you take uh, you took a, um, a decision to move away from the larger forwarders to a smaller forwarder. Uh, was that um, uh, was that leading to higher costs for you? Well, I think Chris Christoph nailed it because uh, large customers or large manufacturers, money is not always the point. What you want is to deliver on time. You want to know where your goods are. Uh, you want to deliver with the highest quality. And usually with working with large uh, manufacturers or large uh, carriers, sorry, um, usually that transparency is only there if the system is working. So if something is not in the system, don't ask because they will not know where it happened. Whereas smaller carriers come in is because they will look into all the details. They will, um, they will try to go through the network until they find where the shipment is. And for us at a certain point, we stopped being a top five uh, consumer electronics manufacturer and we became a top 10. And we immediately noticed what Christoph said also. It's like, you're suddenly not interesting anymore. No, it was Christopher Goodman who said it. <laughs> uh, you stopped being interesting. So I stopped being interesting for the bigger uh, shipper, um, carrier, sorry. And then we had to look for who wants our business. And maybe we went even to a new carrier, but we were the number one for them. And they did everything we needed. All our shipments, uh, I never had a better service level. I never had a better uh, on time and full performance in my life. So and I, we, we, I, you, would, you, you say as um, the smaller carrier has more time to take care of each and every shipment, uh, the customer will feel a better service or what is behind it? I'm not saying that they have the time, but they have the interest to search for a good quality. If you are working in a Schenker or a DHL, just to name a big company, uh, the person we could, of in, course, also mention some of the others. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any, any big one. Yeah. You call your uh, customer service person who is sitting in, in Berlin. Hey, where's my shipments to Madrid? 
oh, I don't see it in the system. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, I don't see it. I don't know where it is. It could be anywhere between Berlin and Madrid. A smaller, a smaller carrier will know exactly who he has hired to go from Berlin maybe to Paris, from Paris to Barcelona, from Barcelona to Madrid. Yeah? So he knows the complete chain. He will go through that chain to find your shipment. Why? Because he needs to secure that you are still happy with him, that you don't walk away to another one. So he will pay attention. He will do all the best he can to make sure that you have all. That is basically the difference. It's people's business. Yeah. So, yeah. so the customer orientation, the customer orientation is on a different level with a smaller forwarder. Daniel, before I will ask Anne something about technology, I will ask you, um, as you, uh, your company is right in between, between the, the very big ones and the medium size, you are actually quite a large company. Um, Uh, how do you differentiate uh, yourself, your company, from these logistics giants? Well, uh, to, the, to the moment, we are still a uh, small uh, for freight forwarder. If you see, uh, totally, we have 6,500 people, yes, in Germany, uh, Poland, Czech, uh, Switzerland, Luxembourg. Um, so, but our focus is really local. So we focus to put the Rote Schleife, we call it in Germany, for the customers. Because we see it's getting more and more customer-centric again. In 1970, you have the product. In 1980, it was the uh, product and the, the customer service, but we focus really on the customer. And that um, is very important if you have some escalations. I, you know, the large freight for this, the escalation process is rather complicated and difficult to define. But if you have a small freight for the, they have added benefits of autonomy, control, and knowledge uh, in their departments. And uh, that you see, you have much more knowledgeable people in smaller freight for us. They can do import and export. They can give much more uh, rapidly, uh, quickly response. And that's very important. Uh. Okay, so you mean this tailoriz tailorization of processes will lead to the uh, situation that the export guy has no clue about the import and that's why he doesn't see the overall chain for the customer. Is that yeah, he, he is, uh, in our t team, we have uh, people that can do import and export. So they don't know exactly how the customer is thinking, what he needs. So we follow the whole shipment. And this in the bigger, large companies you don't have. You have a track and trace. But nobody today is looking at track and trace. I think we have to be much more product, uh, proactive mm. instead of looking behind what has been had. So then you don't have a mistake. And that's the, the focus on smaller uh, components. They have much more time to do the end-to-end -end visibility and look after it. They maybe not cannot propose it, but they follow the shipment. And then they send a small email. Listen, your shipment has arrived. Okay. Very good. And, uh, technology. Yeah. So um, um, the, the larger companies have large IT systems, the latest technology. They offer end-to-end -end visibility with fantastic track and trace systems. Um, is this uh, still um, uh, an advantage that you would see for the larger companies or can smaller companies in the meantime compete? Well, that's uh, the nice thing about uh, Corona and the internet itself, that uh, you have more and more systems moving into the cloud. And uh, also the, the producers of these systems, the software companies, they see a small logistics company as a very valid customer to them and these systems are becoming more and more available to them that means that on the one side these systems that was only available to very large size companies suddenly become available to very small size companies which is leveling the field on the one hand and on the other side also the The, the, these, the data integrations you need in order to make such a system work in a proper way are becoming also less expensive and uh, easier to handle. Often uh, you can integrate today already five, six, seven different systems without being a wizard to, to manage this. And I think this is uh, one of the, the, the biggest points that will come in the, in the coming years where the small size forwarders that are interested in this, in this topic will see a, a very big leverage in their business in order to be a viable um, supplier to their customers. Because a lot of customers, they are asking, can you provide me this? Can you provide me here? Can you provide me there? And uh, until now, they often had to say, sorry, I can't. But now, um, I mean, I'm talking for land transport here. I don't know how it is for C or A freight. But if you buy a truck today, no matter what producer, 
you will already get a telematic system to it, where you most often have the chance to integrate it in your existing TMS system already and provide a visibility to your customer. And I mean, this is, this is expanding more and more. So this is certainly one point where it's getting easier for the small ones to compete there too. On the other hand, uh, what I saw on land transports is that this uh, network Daniel talked already about on, on a local scale where you have a customer and the small ones, they have a really good network of, of guys where they know he's always having a truck here and he always needs this backload. And the bigger ones would not exactly have these, but these uh, modern marketplaces, they make it for them, of course, on the other hand, then easier to find resources to get your goods from A to B, where before they had no chance to find this trucking company because they only had like two or three trucks and maybe they had a fax machine. If so, very good, very good point. And um, maybe I can also add some some of my experience. Uh, I'm also since more than three decades in this industry and uh, have worked for some of the very big uh, players, Kühn and Nagel, for example. And uh, yes, uh, we used to have uh, IT systems, but we also had a lot of legacy. So the smaller companies starting now with the digitalization have the advantage that they do not have to carry the costs for all the old systems. So there is a certain advantage if, if you are born later uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, forwarding uh, industry. Um, and um, uh, that's why I think that was a really um, very interesting insight, uh, Arne. And uh, I would like to uh, finish with, uh, with Chris. As you mentioned, you, had, um, uh, you worked for these large companies and they had to work with their own network. So what does that lead to? If you have to work with your own network as a large forwarder in comparison to a situation where you as a smaller forwarder can choose the best partner you can find on the market. Chris, uh, Chris Stoffer, sorry, we have two Chris's here. Yeah. Uh, uh, bear with me. Yeah, the, um, uh, the situation with the um, uh, overseas, particularly overseas agents, if we um, experience a bad service from one of our overseas agents, then we can and we can find somebody else that's providing a deal with. Um, whereas when I was working with a larger forwarder, um, well, with um, several larger forwarders, <laughs> um, it was always the same case that you had certain branches and centuries that just weren't up to the mark and didn't care about the customers, they didn't care about the cargo, given any feed possible. But you were powerless to do anything about it. And as, in, you're as an employee. You, you might complain to the country manager, to the regional manager, and they'll come back and say, yeah, yeah, we know. But uh, you can't change anything straight away. It's such a, they might get around to it eventually, but in the meantime, if you've got a new customer that's come in and he's got um, cargo moving from that country and he wants an immediate response uh, to some, at least a truck going in and, or somebody contacting his supplier, that cargo moved and it's not happening you in a very awkward situation but as a small forwarder you have that flexibility i can get onto the phone to my agents and if they're not up to the up to the if the service goes downhill or i, I detect that we're not getting the good service that we require to uh, give our customers and i'm free to look around the market and find somebody else that can do that. it's a kind of major advantage very good christopher what I did not hear so far, which is uh, for me a bit surprising, is that uh, in medium-sized forwarders, you do not have so many management layers who also have to be paid. And therefore, maybe the cost advantage you, you have in terms of productivity is eaten up by the number of management layers you have in between. Uh, and I think uh, this is something uh, which, is which we should never point. forget. Yeah, and um, uh, this is definitely... Uh, something which is underestimated compared to the overestimation on the productivity improvement. Yeah? So uh, larger organizations uh, uh, have the necessity to be to be run closely by a, a large management team, and that is of course also very costly. Thanks a lot for uh, for the answers to this I question. Have, uh, uh, yeah, short 
uh, I would have a short addition to this. Also, what you can see with a smaller forwarder is in in times of crisis, you can see that a smaller forwarder is uh, will move easier and quicker to reduce or in in a, in a, uh, for the well-being of both partners, find a way to keep a rate at a stable in a stable way because they are not not held to any profit margins that. Uh, that the stock market is expecting from them. So they could very quickly change to say, okay, I will go down on my 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 profit margin from before maybe 4% down to 2% for the good sake uh, of, uh, of our partnership and maybe go up uh, then again, if crisis is over, market will turn in the other direction or whatever that you will never see from a big one because they just they have other restraints when it comes to this. Okay, very good point. Let me come to the next question. Um, smaller forwarders often claim they offer a better service. Can you please describe what that means? I, I hear that in every, uh, every discussion with smaller forwarders. We have a better service, but for me that's quite fuzzy. Uh, what does better service mean? Can you make KPI out of that? Can you say we are 15.8% better uh, in our service than the others? Can you do something like this or uh, do we have to stay on this more fuzzy level? I would also say that's a more a qualitative than a quantitative um, how do you say, uh, argument. Uh, to the discussion, I'm not sure if if I would sign this. Of course, the the communication is is way better with a smaller one than a bigger one. But if the service really is better, I would not dare to to say yes or no. Okay. Uh, Pedro, maybe from your experience, as uh, from the customer side, uh, how did you measure that? Well, it all depends what you define as a service, right? <coughs> uh, for me, usually the service was also when I have uh, special needs, I want a service from my partner. Uh, but the larger ones usually don't ask them anything after cutoff times, don't come with special requests, last minute truck loadings, whatever. It was always very difficult for them to find a solution. Um, with small carriers, the service was better because, first of all, there was never no as a first answer. The first answer was always, let me look into it. And then maybe four out of five, uh, four out of ten, or six out of ten, they will be able to help me. But for me, that was for a better service. Uh, uh, sorry, Pedro, we have a, a background uh, pr uh, noise problem here. Christopher, could you please uh, uh, switch your, uh, your tone off? Uh, let me. Let me get something uh, from the audience here. Just a second. I hope we can see that. Uh, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Nice to meet you. Um, he says, it's not enough to say that you provide better services. You need to prove it. Yeah? And uh, of course, um, the question is how you can prove that. I agree, Arne, with uh, your statement. It's a qualitative argument. But in nine out of 10 discussions with the medium size or smaller forwarders, um, I get this as an answer. We provide a better service. So my personal advice to medium-sized and smaller forwarders is very clear. When you talk about better service, then measure, make it measurable and be concrete. Otherwise, it's just uh, filling some, some time capsules, nothing else. Huh? Okay, anybody else who wants to say something about that? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, just also what uh, Pedro already mentioned, it's a question how you define better service. That's, I think that's, that's the overall key statement because I do think that um, everybody, whether it's a forwarder, whether it's uh, a customer or whatnot, um, everybody is somehow defining uh, service differently. Whether it's to one, it might be the, the, uh, the responsiveness, how fast do I get information, how fast or how quick can I access information, whether it's a quote, whether it's on tracking, on tracing, um, whether it's just uh, to feel in good hands, you know, that's also part of, of, of a service. Um, 
So it's, it's much rather the question, how does one define service? I think that's the key here. And once those KPIs are mentioned, um, or defined better to say, then it's also easy to measure them against um, your, your competition. So let's just say you say, um, we are the fastest in terms of um, responding to your quote or to your inquiry. You know, that's something that I can clearly measure because I know, okay, someone is, is sending in um, an inquiry and he rece receives the quote same day. Mm. That's easy measurable. Okay, so right now you already have at least part of the service component defined. Someone else, it may be, okay, um, better service. To me, it's maybe um, I want a, a dedicated person to talk to, you know? Okay. okay, by the time I define that for myself, subconsciously, I know, okay, at the smaller forwarder, for instance, I have someone I can pick up the phone, call right away, you know? So in that sense, if, if this is my, my personal KPI for, for service or for better service, it is definitely better. But I do think that service or just putting out we have better service is indeed a little bit opaque um, and intransparent simply because each and everybody defines it differently. That's, that's, that's key, I guess. Okay, very good. Uh, I have two uh, more comments from, from the audience. So, Lisa, thank you for your question. Value added, small forwarders are able to offer compared to big, well-known forwarder due to internal policy. That is uh, number one from uh, uh, Nisa. And we have a second one. Small forwarder usually came from an expert in the industry. They have a great belief, which is close to customer needs, not profit-oriented uh, only. So, that means you offer as a medium-sized forwarder something for free, which the big ones are charging extra and that is the reason why uh, your, your service appears to be better compared to the big ones? If I may answer that, I think we in the beginning already said also that we usually are experts on certain areas. So for example, my company, we are not experts in the business of transporting construction goods. So mm -hmm. I will not offer you that service where maybe a large carrier will also put that into his package. Uh, usually mm -hmm. small areas, you need to focus on specific markets. What are you good at? What do you know well? What is your expertise? Mm -hmm. that you can work and then that you can closely define with your customer what is the service he's looking for. And together you can tailor-made it and make it special for him and make sure that it will work because we are smaller organizations and everybody from all layers, uh, like I said earlier, we all know the customer. Very interesting. And um, I, I agree, if you are small, you cannot do everything, so you have to focus. Otherwise, you are um, mediocre in everything, but not good at, in anything. Uh, I have another comment uh, from Mario Fasanelli. It depends how, uh, about the people in your team, dedicated teams, knowledge is the key of the good service, no matter if you're global or small forwarder. I think that says everything. Uh, thanks for your comment. Uh, I will now switch to the next question. The marketing budgets of the logistics giants are larger than the total revenues of smaller forwarders. How do you get new clients? Well, uh, when we, uh, I, I try to uh, find out the marketing budget of uh, DHL, for example. It's, it's uh, not so easy to get, but um, I'm quite sure uh, they have 10 times more marketing budget per country than you have uh, as a revenue. So that's why when, when you ask somebody on the, uh, on the street, uh, they will definitely know DHL, but not, uh, maybe not Anglo Freight UK in Southampton. So what do you do in order to get new customers? Uh, Christoph, you are a sales guy. <laughs> Well, I guess I guess it's uh, it's it's also a question how you're positioning where your where your targets are and all of that. But um, I think you can definitely do a lot in your local area. You know, whether it's uh, committing to your small um, or local town, uh, a soccer stadium. You know, take up some sponsorship sponsorship in there, um, and also try to you know just to get more present within the current area that you're in. Uh, simply because you also want to represent 
um, your local your local community, so to speak, right? Your local your lo local customers that you also know from from other places. You know, maybe you saw them at the fair and whatnot. Um, on the other hand, side even with your bigger accounts that you're working together with, you can still support them um, and get the referral to other uh, other companies that they are potentially working with that they are looking for expertise. Um, so you're but, talking about word, word of mouth. A lot of, a lot of. And nevertheless, you can still do cold calling, you know. I mean, if you have your expertise in certain areas, uh, get the word out there. Pick up the phone, you know. Okay. Uh, Pedro, talking about Innovatrans. You are uh, since 10 years in the market, so uh, quite a young company still. And you have to build up your, your customer base. How do you do that? Well, we don't even have a budget to go on local uh, publicity. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're really, we're really small. But um, now our business has been grown from mouth to mouth publicity. Um, <clears throat> so we have been re referred sometimes by customers to other customers, carriers referring us uh, smaller customers to us because they they considered they were it was not this interesting for them to do the business. Uh, and since last year, we have started slowly to invest also in. Uh, social uh, network so linkedin twitter facebook having, uh, having our uh, own channel on youtube these are relatively cheap solutions they are giving us a wider scope people are starting to know us and from time to time uh, we get a cold call like uh, can you do it but right now our business drives on mouth to mouth publicity Christopher Goodman, uh, did you take all the yes. customers you learned over the years from the large forwarding companies to your own company? Or how did you grow your business? <laughs> some, some, some of them, like we started up about nine or ten years ago. And uh, yeah, some of those are still, are still with us now. But uh, no, we so, focus very much on our marketing policy uh, on, on how customers save save on their shipping costs not with the, for cheap freight quotes or cheap freight prices but overall if they come to us it will help them avoid any expensive mistakes guide them through it and hopefully overall uh show them a saving at the end of the day but we uh, aimed most of our uh, budget previously uh, 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 on group marketing and now we're moving more and more into uh focused on focused on linkedin which so allows LinkedIn us is to becoming direct really, our more directly. Yeah. So LinkedIn is really becoming the the channel of choice to grow your business, uh, as I understand, and I also hear from a lot of other uh, other companies. Uh, although, uh, of course, it's difficult to stand out if uh, you have hundreds and thousands of posts running through your timeline every day. But uh, okay, I I understand that. And uh, when uh, I asked Daniel, um, I will not ask you as, as you are um, a self-employed consultant, and I know how difficult it is to, to get consultant uh, clients, but Daniel, uh, guys has thousands, ten thousands of customers. And do you still send out the troops uh, of um, field sales people to visit the customers uh, 10 per, per week or something like that? <coughs> Not 10 per week, but uh, we focus on uncertain customers. Sure, in Luxembourg, we start from the stretch again. Uh, there, there we offered also more expertise uh, that we say we are just not staying only on air freight. We're offering also ocean freight and uh, FTL for road freight. So diversified our portfolio that opens us again down the door for other um, products. Huh? But uh, yes, we have to open the door, uh, but we uh, we're selling us as, as expert because all the players are not doing always the best jobs or in certain areas they're not strong enough due to the fact that if you have a, a member of a WCA membership and you get a lot of sales leads and you help them also and then you get much more business from outside uh, requests and then you have to quote to propose them it's not always easy because um, if you say it's zero costs then it's still too expensive uh, for certain countries but okay that's the the market eh? so um, we have to go out visit the customer and um, keep what we are selling. Huh? Very good. Okay, let me come to the next question. Um, what need smaller forwarders do to be successful in the market? Actually, that's the last question um, for, for today's session. 
and I would like to start in my upper left corner. No, it's the upper right corner. Sorry, uh, it's mirrored here. Arne, um, what do you um, suggest and uh, advise smaller and medium-sized forwarding companies in order to stay comp competitive or gain competitiveness in the market? Well, what we heard during the whole discussion was uh, you need to stay uh, quick on your feet and lean uh, on how to stay quick on your feet. Well, I cannot advise because that's uh, operations and uh, everybody manages his operations in a different way. So it's uh, hard to tell somebody how he has to talk to the customer or whatever. But uh, in order to uh, give the people the possibility to be quick on their feet, uh, to become lean, lean in your process, uh, lean on uh, how you manage certain things, uh, lean on your escalation processes. This is, uh, you just have to put that down that because the, the, the big ones, they're not sleeping, they also want to become uh, more effective in everything they do. And you know, the, the, the easiest, uh, the most, the most pumped for your bucks, as the American would say, is invest in uh, digitalization. I mean, of course, uh, it's also some of my business, but it's the easiest and the quickest way to, uh, to go there. And then once that is done, all the rest will usually follow. I mean, um, even with the driver shortage, there are, of course, there's no solution. There's no digital solution to, uh, to a new driver. But it will make the work of your driver or your freight forwarding agent or whatever will make it way easier. If you are in sales and you have a modern CRM system, the CRM system is not to control you, but it's uh, in order to help you to make your job better. And it's all these uh, systems that uh, will just uh, accelerate uh, your business. Very good. Thanks a lot. Uh, digitalization, yes, and uh, the topic of the driver shortage is a topic for one of the next uh, Tabjo fixes uh, because that is something which you can easily talk for for three hours or even longer. Uh, Daniel, what is your advice, maybe yeah. to your own company or to others? Yeah, Arnold said already a lot of uh, good things. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, points like the escalation process. This has to be short, quick, reactive, and this you can have in a smaller team. If you have now a big player, then it's going to the key account manager, then it's going to, up to the board member and all this done. It's too long. The customer needs a quick response within an hour, and that's very important. Uh, flexibility also in the process. So that gives you also for smaller freight forwarder, um, they are much more agile. Um, if you have a big, large freight forwarder, they have a certain account of containers which are um, going to a certain area, and then you are stuck then you don't have some capacity. A small freight forward is looking for an alternative, and that gives you much more flexibility and agility. And very important is the, that we are still missing today. It's uh, employee knowledge. Yeah? Um, you see less and less uh, knowledge people in the market, getting less and less people to hire. And that's um, a very important um, factor for small freight forwarder. But it has a cost. But on the other side, it gives uh, much more return to the customer because he gets much quicker response what the customer needs. So, and the industry network is uh, also important to have a good network, but also the relationship to the customer, very important. And we're coming more and back again to customer-centric solutions again. So we have to make uh, the road to Schleife again. Huh? <laughs> Christopher, for you as a native UK, um, uh, red ribbon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, uh, Pedro. Yeah. I would like to add to this. Uh, you should never be too satisfied with the results you have today or with your success. Your customer, your uh, competitors slash enemies are just waiting for you to make your first failure and they will jump in. So if you need to keep working on a good relationship with your customers, make sure that uh, you know exactly how they feel, you know what they want, be ahead if possible, of their needs. And like Daniel said, keep investing in your people to be to have always the best people working for you. Very good. Thanks a lot. Christoph, uh, yeah, shy to this time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely also join both Daniel and Pedro. Uh, number one, could put your client and your client's needs first. Uh, that's by far the most important thing. Uh, and second of all, uh, yeah, take good care of your employees and also make sure 
as Daniel already said, that also the new onboarded members are getting well trained and well knowledge, and that they are able to, you know, soak up all um, all the know-how just to make sure that they are also providing such an excellent job. Because at the end of the day, um, it's not so much I guess about the right tracking or tracing system or whatnot, or if you're paying a hundred dollars more or less but uh, much rather about uh, experienced, uh, well-trained people that are able to satisfy the client and their questions and, and whatnot. Okay, thanks a lot. Now the other Christoph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to endorse what Christoph had just said, actually. And uh, I think one of the things that we've done at Anglo Freight that I'm quite proud of is that um, a couple of years ago, we focused on bringing in new talent into attracting new talent into freight forwarding, going to the colleges and hiring um, apprentices to work through an apprenticeship program. Some of those have now worked their way through that and they're now um, quite able to uh, handle whole processes related to freight forwarding on their own. So we're quite proud of achieving that. And I think having a happy um, atmosphere where people are motivated and want to come into work and have a, an enjoyable experience working for us. It's very important to us being able to have the relationship that we want with our customers so that they're happy as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we are nearly done. Um, uh, this was uh, also for me very exciting. Um, I, I think uh, there is room for both. Yeah, of course, uh, you need uh, the, the big players in the market, especially uh, for the big customers, because the fluctuations of a big customer can easily kill your whole organization if you cannot provide the capacity. That's clear. Yeah, so um, a large customer can have a need for two trucks today and tomorrow for 20 trucks and the next day again seven trucks. You, you, cannot, you cannot deliver this as a smaller customer, uh, company. That's clear. But I think there is uh, room for both, for the smaller um, uh, forwarders as well as for the larger uh, forwarders. It all depends, of course, on the use case, on what is needed by the customer. And um, uh, when, when I look at, uh, at the market, what we should never forget, we see a concentration and a consolidation on the market on the forwarder side. But the number of shippers is quite stable. So we, we are talking about millions of shippers in the market, millions. When you look at uh, LinkedIn and you make uh, a search for supply chain management director, you will find more than a million across the world. Yeah? And uh, the number of forwarders is going down, but the number of customers is quite stable. And uh, therefore, uh, it's the question on how to focus and um, how to be as efficient as possible. And Anna, coming back to your point regarding uh, uh, digitalization uh, is becoming cheaper and um, um, yeah, more affordable also for the smaller customers. And I think those uh, topics are um, extremely important for the, um, for the smaller forwarders in order to stay competitive in the future. I would like to thank you all. It was uh, a pleasure to have you here. And um, I think I selected the right people for this kind of discussion. Uh, we will have uh, our um, next uh, Tapjo fix next week. We are talking about um, ocean freight rate development. Uh, if you are interested to join, please uh, refer to our website. You can, um, uh, you can um, um, uh, register uh, yourself for this meeting. We will also be presented on LinkedIn Live. And please don't forget the digital logistics marketplace pre-registrations uh, can be done as of now. And um, uh, you can see me, uh, uh, colleagues of mine, uh, in, a, in a live chat tomorrow if you're interested. Thanks a lot. Have a good rest of the day, a good start into the week. Um, see you next time. Bye. Take care.